Man, those introduction things are just, I know they have to happen, but, and I know you need to know a little something, but it's always very weird. Um, I really, really am glad to be back. Sounds like we're echoing. You got it? And uh, <clears throat> when I was here four years ago, I had just finished the, uh, the three years of schooling for the Doctor of Ministry degree that I did. And uh, over the last three years, it has been a grueling experience of trying to get a dissertation done, especially when I don't like to write. I didn't get that part from my dad. I like to talk, I like to hang out with people, I like to do music, but I don't like to write. Um, so that was a real discipline. It was, a, it was really hard. And uh, I'm really, really, really grateful to God that I finished. But there's a number of things that really impacted me doing it. It was called Discipleship to Jesus in the 21st century. And so most of it was talking about what does discipleship look like on your own, in church, and outside. And uh, it shaped this material that I've been doing, as I mentioned. I've been, I've been at this, this summer made 30 years since the day the Lord first said this to me. When he rescued my walk with Jesus. That um, I, I, I was 30 years old. I had just become the senior pastor of this church, and I thought it would be such a great idea if I talked about love, since that's the most important thing. But as I began to preach the sermons week after week, what I discovered that was the more that I delved into the love of God, and what it was supposed to look like, the more that I realized that I didn't do a very good job at it. And that was really discouraging to me. So I went day after day after day to seek the Lord to go, you need to change me, please. Because I grew up in a Holy Spirit tradition, um, we were used to calling out to God, expecting God to do crazy things in our lives. And so the passage that I was uh, spending time with the Lord crying out to is Ezekiel 36, 26, where the Lord promised, I will give you a new heart. And I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of flesh, or your heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you to cause you to, be, to obey my decrees and keep my laws. So as I was praying, I was saying, God, remove from me this heart of stone. Do some miraculous thing that would just so radically transform my heart. Make me different. Make me someone who would just start loving people and loving you. Really loving you. In fact, one of the troubling passages that wasn't even necessarily related to love was Philippians when Paul said, you know, I don't know what, I could, what to choose. If I could die to be with Jesus, I'd die right now. But to stay is good, to die is good, it's all good. I don't know what to choose. And all I could think of then, even as a 30-year-old, was that, yeah, I'd like to die to get out of here. But not to be with you. You know, where I had been married for, for some years at that point, and I'm thinking, when I was away... I miss Robin. I mean, I've already talked to Robin several times, and I've only been away for 24 hours. I love my wife. I love my wife deeply. And I just thought of Paul saying, if I could die to be with Jesus, I would choose that. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. Not in the same way that if I could go home right now and see Robin, I'd go home. I like being with her. So I'm like, Lord, what's wrong with me? I don't think I love you like Paul's talking about, a way of loving you, and I certainly don't love people very well. And here I was, the senior pastor, so it's like, if you don't fix me, then I want to get out. Let me go back to being a builder again. I can't screw anybody up. Too bad. Too bad. <laughs> right? So, uh, so anyway, it was 30 years ago when the Lord began this this work in my life to just say, Mark, it's not a transplant, it's transformation. And it happens by coming to me who is love and let me let you love you first and then you'll love because. And, um, and so it's been an amazing 30 years. I love being a Christian now. More than anything in the whole world. 
After 18 years of being a Christian when I was 30, I wasn't so sure. It had become hard, it had become discouraging. Most of the time I felt like I was just failing all the time. And I got tired of that. And it was hard to share the gospel because you didn't want to invite somebody into that. You know, it was okay to share the gospel when it was trying to keep somebody out of hell. But that's not the gospel message. I was at the NCS chapter this morning and I was just telling people, you know, that's not what Jesus proclaimed was a message of get out of hell. His message was come into life. Come, get reconciled to God, the one who loves you beyond comprehension, and discover the life that was intended for you. It was an invitation into life, not get out of hell. That's the byproduct. This is eternal life, Jesus said, John 17, 3, to know the Father and me, whom he sent. It's about relationship. And so I'm like, Lord, after 18 years of being a Christian back then, I'm like, what happened? How come it's not fun anymore? I don't know that I love you like Paul talks about, and I certainly don't love people the way you're describing. So please change me. Fix me. And all those years ago, he began through that verse, 1 John 4, 19, Mark, you love because I first loved you. But it was five years later that he brought me to the new command. And that changed everything. You know, we have these titles. I think when I came four years ago, I was supposed to say freedom changes everything, and I tried to make that work, and I'll explain to you in a moment why it's understanding changes everything. But after a while, you think like seven changes everything, you know, you think, really? <laughs> you know, at some point you kind of go, honestly, Jesus and the Holy Spirit changed everything. They changed everything. Everything. That's the real truth. But understanding the new command also changed everything for me. As a believer, my walk with Jesus, and my interaction with people, it changed everything. So let me tell you why. Open up in your, your notes there, if you haven't already. So I did. So it says, understanding changes everything. And I, where I was headed with that was originally I was going to do a little bit of stuff on this thing that I also teach called getting along. Whoops, losing my balance. And, uh, but in the end, I felt like the Lord wanted me to, to go in the direction that I am with you. And, uh, and the reason is because in healing conversations, understanding is everything. Just as in real estate, location, location, location is everything. In communication, understanding, understanding, understanding is everything. And it's learning to understand before seeking to be understood. You get that one thing down, and it can change a lot. It can make a huge difference. But then when Paul got a hold of it, and uh, he started talking about um, until we understand God's love. Well, I wrote these couple of bullets here, so I just want to read them to keep me moving forward. I wrote, number one there, it depends on what you're trying to change. What do Christians need to change? You realize that one of the parts of my dissertation, I entitled it the Jesus brand. Christians identified by loving others as God has loved them. Do you realize that if you wear the label Christian, the way people are supposed to identify us is by the way we love each other and by the way we love those around us and in this book called Unchristian, three years worth of survey data. In this book called Unchristian, the data said in the high 80 percentile that, the, that 80 percent of those between 19 and 30 something believe that Christians were hypocritical, judgmental, self-righteous, homophobic, and irrelevant. 80 percent identify Christians that way. That's a problem. No. No. It's a problem. We're supposed to be identified by love, and those are the labels that they're using for us. Things need to change. 
Number two, if simply understanding more about God's love changed our behavior, I think we would have a more favorable report because so many people tell me they know God loves them. You know, this is the thing that kind of blew me away was that when I first started talking about this, people would say this to me all the time. Mark, we know God loves them. Everybody knows God loves them. I said, yeah, well, my, I know my wife loves me too, but that's not the point. The joy of being married is being loved by my wife and loving my wife every day. It's experiencing that exchange of loving and being loved. That's how I know she loves me. That's the joy of being married. It's not, I know God loves me because I read John 3.16 or something. It's not understanding in that sense. And I'm going to cut, finish with that passage when Paul says that you would know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God and to know this love that surpasses his knowledge. There are actually two different words. The word that mostly gets translated to grasp does mean to comprehend, to, to intellectually comprehend. But the word to know is that relational knowing, that intimacy knowing, that experiential knowing, that we need to know both ways, how wide and long and high and deep is that love. And to know that love that surpasses knowing. That's the whole point, that you would know this love that surpasses knowing, that surpasses knowledge until you are filled to the measure of all the fullness of me, God says. So if it was just about understanding the love of God, then we would have a much better reputation. It's not about understanding. It's not that we need more teaching. We need to experience that love in profound ways and regularly and daily so that it changes us. I got a two amens out there. Anybody else believe? Amen. Sweet. Anyhow. Number three, neuroscience has a lot to say about how the brain learns or unlearns things. And sadly, I think overall we've not done our spiritual practices, primarily our time with Bible, prayer, and community in ways that really transform or change our minds and thus our behavior. James, you mentioned about the word transformation tonight. You know, the, another survey that I got a hold of that was a pretty extensive survey, surveyed Christians and 80% of Christians believe that they should spend time with God and that they should read the Bible, but only 40% of them actually did it. And when they were asked how much, most of them did it be around 10 minutes a day, if it was daily. And they prayed in transit. And their prayer was usually, God, bless my family, help this, help that. If you do that every day, that's not going to change you. If that's your, your spiritual practices, is to read something new every day. I think I gave this illustration when I was with you before, but I mean, I can change it up even with uh, uh, exercise, right? <clears throat> if I want to look like Chip there, it looks like he's been kind of doing some... Uh, some work there. And, uh, he can say to me, he says, well, Mark, you just got to go to the gym and lift. So I go to the gym and I lift. And I come back and I still look as scrawny as I am right now. And I go, dude, man, I did what you said. I went to the gym and I lifted. He says, so how'd you do it? Well, I went to each thing and I picked up the lightest one because I didn't want it to be uncomfortable. And <laughs> I did it one time and I put it down and then I went to the other one and I did it one time and put it down and I did that three days a week for a year. How come I don't look like you, dude? You can actually go to the gym and do things, but do things in a way that aren't going to change you. You can do spiritual practices in a way that are not going to change you. They're not going to change you. Exposure to truth does not internalize truth. And a Christian, so many Christians expose themselves to a little piece of truth, maybe 10 minutes, maybe a little devotional, every single day, but it's new every single day. Can you remember what you read five days ago? Four days ago? Three? What about this morning? You have to internalize this stuff. We have to internalize the Word. It has to become a part of who we are. But it's not just the Word, and that's especially what I'm here to do this second time with you guys. But the thing about transformation, the thing about change, number four, they're teaching versus training. This is probably one of the... 
This was so important to me. Most of us, I don't know why, maybe because Matthew's the first gospel or whatever, but there's such emphasis on quote-unquote the Great Commission. Right? You've all heard about the Great Commission. There's probably not a single guy in this room that hasn't heard the Great Commission. Go and make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all that I've commanded you. I got a feeling Jesus meant more than the way we do teaching. That um, it wasn't listening to a sermon once a week. I think what he meant, as you'll see here, number four, that says there's a lot of teaching and study in the church, but what about training? The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Why I had that verse in there, because I did a lot of cut and pasting of my stuff to try to get something shorter for you guys. And if I don't get my rear gear here, I'm not going to get through it. But I like when I start my weekend seminar, I'll ask, if you believe that a disciple of Jesus and a Christian are the same thing, raise your hand. If you believe that a disciple of Jesus and a Christian is the same thing, raise your hand. If you, yeah, and some of you aren't sure. Some. Well, the verse says right here, the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Absolutely, disciples and Christians are the same. The problem is, is that the word and the label Christian can mean just about anything to anybody. But the word disciple, in context, only had one meaning. Disciple was a student, or an, and I think the way better word is an apprentice. A disciple was an apprentice to a master to become like that master. And they were trained. And so Jesus says in Luke 6.40, the student, this is at the end of bullet four there, the student is not above the teacher, but when... They are fully trained. They will become like the teacher. That's transformation. It's becoming from one thing to another. The expectation was that they would observe the master. They would listen to the master. He would have them do something. He would do something with them. But it was training. So many of you, whatever the things you've done, you had training, which included instruction. But it wasn't just teaching. You had to touch things. You had to do things. You had to practice things to get good at whatever you got good at. So the biggest question to me was, what was Jesus training the disciples to do like him? And that's number five there in your notes. And I believe it was to love as he had loved them. This is a really important question. I, 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 when I meet with other pastors, I ask them regularly, I said, how do you recognize a disciple that you've made one? What do you do when you're able to go, oh, there's a disciple of Jesus. What are you seeing? Is it that they've got, you know, they're dressed up and got their Bible and they're walking into a church? It's the fruit, right? It's the Jesus fruit. Do you see compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with, forgiving? There will be behaviors, there will be attitudes, but it will be primarily loving as Jesus had loved. Loving as Jesus had loved. So here in the bullet there, it says in number five, what did he train them to do like him? To love as he had loved them. John writes in John 13, 1, having loved his own, referring to the chapters 1 to 12, he loved them to the end. Crazy cool transition verse. He says that chapters 1 to 12 was him loving his own, and then from 13 to 21, he loved them to the end. You know what? I did the math. I thought about what was it like if Jesus was loving the disciples for three years, 10 hours a day for three years. That's 10,950 hours. What's the buzz out there these days for how many hours does it take to become a master? 10,000. We're talking just about 11,000, and that's just 10 hours a day. That was three years. Three years they got loved. 10,000, almost 11,000 hours. They were loved by Jesus. They observed Jesus loving others. He would encourage them to do it. He would coach. He would train. He would teach. He was doing all of that, but mostly he taught them to love 
by loving them. By loving them. And then a lot of folks don't even catch it, the rest of it. He loves them that night, that final night. He washes their feet. That's a whole nother thing, got no time for. But he washes their feet. Then he tells them this amazing stuff. He does this amazing prayer in John 17. He goes out there and suffers for them, dies for them. And then he's resurrected. And then he has all these resurrection appearances. He loved them to the end. He loves Peter out there on the beach and reinstates them. It's amazing. Their whole experience from the time they were introduced to him until the time he was ascended was about being loved by him so they could turn around and love as he had loved them. He was training them to love as he loved. And the most important way he did it, by loving them, not just saying, here, watch me. In fact, you think about doing, doing the disciples' feet. I often thought if he was in the 21st century, he was like any one of us, he would have got down and washed one guy's feet and then got up and said, and the rest of you do the same. But do you realize that he took time and did all 12? All 12. Which means every single guy had that moment when Jesus was down on his knees and looking up in his face and washing his feet, including Peter and Judas. And do you realize what a training that was? Twelve times watching Jesus do it again and again and again and thinking about what that guy was like that Jesus was caring for and washing the feet of. That's training. Amazing, right? And then on that night he says the new commandment. Now, I mentioned this to you guys four years ago, but I mention it every moment of every day that I can. I think the new command is the foundation and the heart and soul of what it means to be like Jesus. The new command, he says, now love one another as I have loved you. Can I borrow two guys that didn't do this with me four years ago that are friends that can come up here and do an example for me for a second? There's somebody that's here tonight with a friend that was not here four years ago. Anybody? I wasn't here. He's a friend. He was Okay. Why don't you guys come? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> So, Brian, why don't you stand here, Chip, you stand there. So we'll see if this works. Most of the time I do it with a husband and a wife. I spend the whole time making sure that I don't interact with the husband. <laughs> so, I hope, so I hope it works. But it actually happened quite by accident. I was, I was preaching in a church and I meant to... to, to do the illustration as though I was Jesus. But I used my own name. And here's what happened. We'll see if it happens again. Is I said, Brian, would you please love Chip as I, Mark Fee, have loved you? As you have loved me? As I have loved you. As Mark Fee, as I have loved you, would you please love Chip? You have loved me. Perfect. Now, did you see all the awkwardness that he was doing? That was totally appropriate because I don't know Brian and I haven't had an interaction with him. Okay? But now, can I give you a hug, dude? Sweet. Bless you. Now, Brian, would you please love Chip as I, Mark Fee, have loved you? Awesome, thanks, dude. Yeah. I appreciate it. Jeez, I'm down to 17 minutes. Dang. How did it go by so fast? Jeez. But please don't miss it, you guys. In the Greek, the word that's for new. See, we're so familiar with new, we almost would hear new as another command. But new in the Greek. Here are the three words that the, that the scholar wrote for the definition of new. Strange, remarkable, and unknown. Strange, remarkable, 
and unknown. What makes the new command strange, remarkable, and unknown is what you just saw right here. Brian could not obey what I asked him to do until he had an experience with me first. That awkwardness that he had, you realize that should be every one of our awkwardness. If Jesus says, Mark, would you please love... It's Brian too, right? Yeah, so I'm, I freaked. I got two Brians happening here. Do you spell your names different? But the point is, is that you can't obey that command without an experience with Jesus first. It's not possible. That's what makes it unique. That's what makes it remarkable. That's what makes it new. And quite frankly, I can't, I want to say this carefully, but you understand when Jesus was asked which of the 613 commands were the greatest, when he said love God and he said love your neighbor, it left the, and said the 611 were supposed to all be a working out of those two commands. But that was the old covenant. On the night when he made the new covenant and he gave the new command, this new command can only be done by an experience and a relationship with Jesus. You know, the old, the, the love your neighbor as yourself, anybody can do that without a relationship with God. You know, the, the, the outworking of that command is really Matthew 7, 11, I think, 7, 12, 7, 11, when he says, do to others what you'd have them do unto you. For this sums up, fulfills all the law. Do you realize that a second century, third century Roman emperor, it's called the golden rule because as a pagan emperor, he thought it was just such a good motto, he had the thing carved in gold in his palace as the motto for the Roman Empire, but had no relationship with God. But you cannot do the new command without being loved by Jesus first. And he couldn't give that command until the night when it's the night when he's doing the new covenant, the new command, and then he talks about the Holy Spirit, which makes it all possible. This is why he transitions into the talk about the Holy Spirit. Remember, you guys, it looks like most of you are old enough. Do you guys remember the song, um, um, Oh, what a night. Late December back in 63. I can hear the disciples going, Late December back in 33. <laughs> what a very special time for me. <laughs> right? Oh, what a night. I'm telling you, if those guys had that song, they would have been humming that song every day until they saw Jesus again. Because I'm telling you, there was no other night like that night. On that night, everything changed. The new covenant that had been prophesied through Jeremiah <laughs> was fulfilled when he said, this cup now is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. A permanent new covenant in the blood of Jesus was executed on that night. He gives the new command and says, this, and by the way, most people don't know that the very next verse after the new command is, by this, all people will know that you have that you are mine, that you have love for one another. So many people know that verse, but don't realize it. It's those two sentences go together. Love one another as I have loved you. By this, all people, by this, all people will know that you're mine. Because you love as I have loved you. So here is the key question, though, in my mind, was when, well, shoot, Jesus, we got ripped off. Because then you went and ascended, you're gone. What about the rest of us? The disciples got 11,000 hours. We get zero. How's that supposed to work? You know, one of the lowest moments in, in my dissertation was right before Christmas 2017. I got, I got, how am I doing? Oh God, I can't, I can't tell you that. Shoot. <laughs> oh, you guys. Huh? Yeah. I just got to tell you, I, I can't, please help me, Jesus. But I got to tell you, I'd gone back and forth on my first chapter with my professors for months. First a proposal, then a finished chapter. It's two weeks from Christmas. Eight months later, I have to have an entire dissertation written. 
The opening of the email is, Mark, we're really sorry. That is not the way you want to get an email from your profs. Oh, Mark, I'm really sorry. And I'm like, oh, my stomach got into knots. And they go, Mark, I, we don't know how we missed this, but do you actually really think you're supposed to be loved by Jesus? Yeah. Well, they wrote, they said, here's a couple quotes from a couple scholars who believe that the new command is interpreted this way, is that it's become the new rule, ethic, standard, or principle that we're supposed to try to live a sacrificial life like Jesus did. Do you realize that's not what the command said? It's like saying, Jesus says, a new command I give to you. Try to love each other as I have loved you. Like it was a past tense, like it's a rule, like it's a standard. They said, Mark, you better find somebody else because it's not like in the Christian history that somebody hasn't proposed something new. And I'm like, proposing something new is what Jesus said. <laughs> Love as I've loved you. I don't know what those guys are saying, but that's what he said. And they said, I had to look at 37 commentaries on John before I only found three guys who were actually saying what I was saying. 37 commentaries on John before I found somebody who was saying what I was saying. I'm going, serious, how is that possible? It's like it's just, it's been missed. It's been skipped over. Again, it's love God, love your neighbor, but somehow what about love as Jesus has loved us? Well, isn't that what great salt does? Isn't that where great salt says? Oh, grace. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. In fact, one of, my, one of the professors said that was, and all the covenants began with being loved first mm -hmm. by God, right? God loved first all the way from the Old Testament, all the way through. It's always been that way. In fact, I was talking with somebody today when, he, when they brought up the, he says, love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Everybody takes that out of context. But chapter 4 of Deuteronomy, Moses goes through this long historical thing of saying, what, where God says, what other God loved you, a people like you? What other God did this for people? What other God loved the people? Did this, did this, did this, did this? And then he says, and so will you love me back? It was always being loved first. And then we loved. It's been that way with God from the beginning. It's always been grace first, and then we love out of that grace. Amen. Oh, God help us. And oh, Mark, you are in so trouble. <laughs> oh, you guys, I'm sorry. Okay. Here we go. The bottom of the page, number six. Here's the cool thing, though. Is Jesus loved this way. He loved this way. Look at what he says. Just as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. You know how many times Jesus took off to go get alone with the Father? I don't think he went out and did a little passing prayer time. I think he went out to be loved by the Father. You'll see in those brackets there, there are six passages where Jesus talks about how the importance of the love of the Father is to him. It mattered that he knew the love of the Father. And I'm convinced that throughout the day and in his alone times, he was out there being loved by Dad. Then we find out, turn the page, we find out that he did this in the power of the Spirit. This too, you guys, is so important where he says, Luke writes, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. In Acts 10.38, um, Luke writes, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Peter said, Jesus, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all of those who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. You guys, here's the deal is that God's goal, Jesus' goal as the first, as the second Adam was for us to be transformed into his likeness and continue living out the human life, the human image bearer. The Son is the image of the invisible God. You and I are supposed to be being transformed into that same image, continuing to bear witness and image forth the likeness of God. 
This is why Jesus said it's a good thing that I leave, because if I leave, we're going to send the Spirit back, and when the Spirit comes back, me and the Father are going to make our home in you, and we're going to transform you so that you continue what I was doing in the flesh, where you are. You didn't get saved from hell and then to sit around and waste your life away until Jesus comes back and you die. You got saved into this most incredible experience to get filled with the Holy Spirit, have sins forgiven, and then He would begin to transform you that you would become one who would love like Jesus loved. By being loved first. Look at the next verse there. Well, Verse or number eight, faster, 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 Mark. <laughs> then they find out that God loved them up close and personal through Jesus. See, you guys, this is the other thing that's so, so, so important. Remember this night. Oh, what a night. Oh, what a night. Oh, what a night. On that night, he says, here's the new command. And then he tells them, as the Father's loved me, so have I loved you. Then he says these most remarkable words. Just, Philip says, just show us the Father. That's all we need. And he says, how can you say, show us the Father? Have I been among you for so long and you don't know who I am? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, that the words I say I do not speak of my own authority? Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing His work. So believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe in the evidence of the works themselves. Oh, what a night! They find out that those 11,000 hours wasn't just the man Jesus, but it was God, very God, by the presence of the Spirit in Jesus, revealing Himself in human form so that we could see it and get it and experience that love up close and personal. I'm telling you, without the gift of the Holy Spirit, it would have made me stinking jealous. I was jealous as a young Christian. That is so stinking unfair that those guys got 11,000 hours with Jesus, and what about the rest of us poor saps who believe in Jesus and then we're slogging it out and just trying to be good Christians? Oh, what a night! Then Jesus says, but I'm going to send the Spirit. And He and the Father and I, we are going to come dwell in you and make our home in you. And we are going to transform you and change you by loving you. So then the next passage there, look at this, number 10. He anticipates the question, so I already just said that, that He's going to send the Spirit, the Spirit of truth. God's going to be in us. But look at number 11. <clears throat> Training and likeness is still God and Jesus' goal. Paul writes, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as the Lord, the Spirit. You see, this is the family business. I think the big truck says Yahweh and sons. <laughs> It should be the big sign on the church. Yahweh and sons and daughters, image makers. Transforming people to love the Jesus way. Discipleship is a lifelong training relationship with God and Jesus by the Spirit to become like Him. To love as He has loved us in order to partner with Him in His mission. The family business until He comes. This is what you got saved for. And there's nothing more thrilling in the whole world to be a part of. Seriously. And it happens as we behold the image of the Spirit. The practice that we're going to do this weekend is the God sighting practice. You see what Paul said there? And what he's doing is, is he's recalling when Moses was going into the tent of meeting, right? And he had the veil, and then the veil would come off, and he'd, the glory of God would be on. But right before that, when he put Moses in the cleft of the rock, he told Moses that nobody can see his face and live, Right? So what Paul is saying here is this. He says, but we all with unveiled faces all behold the glory of God. But see, we can't look at God himself because you look at God and you'll die. So instead, he's, what he says, it's like God is standing in front of a mirror 
We can look at the mirror. We can't look directly at him, but we can look in the mirror. And he says, when you look at the mirror, who's in the mirror? Jesus. But it's God, too. But he says, the one you can see and you can look at is Jesus. But then what he's going on to say, but you and I are supposed to be being transformed into his likeness so that people can look into the mirror and see us. And go, so that's what God is like. We're the product, you guys. What God is trying to do is to transform us into those by the Spirit who would love as He has loved us in the way that Jesus lived the fully human life that Adam was supposed to live. It's why He's called the second Adam. The Son is the image of the invisible God. He made the invisible God visible and that's what we're supposed to do. This is why God said you can't create an idol. We're his idol. That's the literal word when it says likeness and image. It means idol. In in the, in the, in the, oh, come on, stop ticking. So I can't tell you that either now. Shoot. But the bottom line is that's why he couldn't make any image because we're his image. We're his image. He fashioned us from the ground and then breathed his spirit into us so that we would be the physical manifestation of his likeness and then fill the earth with his glory. Amen. We're the idol. And the idol is alive. The idol has ears. The idol has eyes. The idol has a voice. The idol can touch. The idol is like the living God who lives and manifest his likeness. This is what you're on the planet for. And the only way to become like that is you've got to be loved daily by him in order to love as loved. So, I gotta, I'm finishing, I promise. <laughs> Paul knows better, but <laughs> I'm really trying. So turn the page. So I just want to, and this I'll just read to you. But you guys, here's the bottom line. I mentioned to you earlier about Chip going to the gym and telling me to go to the gym. You see, the only way we're going we're gonna to be transformed into that likeness to love is loved is you've got to spend time with him. There's just no other option. You've got to go to the gym. You got to spend time, and then you got to spend the time in a way that's actually going to change you. Amen. And the goal is He wants to change us, that we would love as He's loved us. And we got to be regularly loved through words and actions. It's the only way human beings know it. Right? I mean, Richard, I, I can. Did you feel it? No, you didn't. He's just being kind. But inside I was going, Richard, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, dude. But see, it doesn't matter how deeply I feel love for Richard. If I don't say or do anything, he will never know it's in my heart. And you realize that God limited himself to the human Jesus to reveal his love through words and actions, through Jesus. No one had ever seen God, but by the Spirit, Jesus was manifesting God, His likeness to everyone around Him. And that's what we're longing for, is that people would fall in love with God. So you got to spend time. So here's the deal. The bottom line for me was when I used to think about spending quiet time, the easiest word for me was a performance review. Does anybody ever feel like your quiet time is a performance review? Right? Search me, O oh God. See if there's any offensive way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. You'd read the scripture, especially the New Living Translation. Uh, I like that translation for a lot of things, but in the Second Timothy three sixteen, that the the word is good is useful for showing what's wrong in your life and, and telling you what you ought to do right. And I go, oh, that's beautiful. 
That's what everybody thinks out there. So you come to Scripture, and it's going to point out what's wrong, and it's going to try to tell you what's right, and then you're going to walk out, and you're going to try not to screw up, and you're going to try harder, and you're going to try to change your behavior, and it's a performance review, and most of the time you're going to come in and feel like you're falling short. That's what was going on in my life. Amen. And you don't really want to invite people into that. <laughs> it's why evangelism doesn't happen. Because if we were really loving our walk with God, you wouldn't be able to keep your mouth shut. Hello, how many times did Jesus say, don't tell anybody what I've done for you, and what do they go do? They can't keep their mouth shut. That's the way it was when I first met Jesus. I couldn't keep my mouth shut. Because he touched me, he changed me, he loved me, and I wanted people to come meet him. I wasn't caring about hell. I wanted them to meet this one who loved me and changed me. So it has to change our, our perspective of when we come to, to meet with him. What are you thinking about? Is it a performance review? Is it duty? What is it? Well, this last page, what I would really love for you to do, maybe if you get a second tonight before you go to bed, is I'd love for you to read down through this last page. And now, see, I'm, gonna, I'm stopping, Paul. How about that, dude? But bullets 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19, I would like for you to read through those. Because they're first person from the Lord. And I want you to hear from him about his excited anticipation for your arrival. You know, you guys, I, For the longest time when the Lord started doing this for me, I really struggle with sometimes the way we start church and we use this big word, the invocation, you know, and we invite God. And in the vineyard, we used to always say, come Holy Spirit. I just think that's theologically off. Do you realize when we gather together, He's already here waiting. Do you realize that He was here? You know what our invocation should be? Father, we are so glad you're here. Would you please help us notice that's the stinking prayer. Help me stop thinking about how mad I was at the kids in the car and what's going on with my wife and help me to notice that you're here and to engage you with all my heart. But do you realize when you came, because God is loving, He's always loving, there's never a moment that He's not loving you, that when you come into His presence, He's waiting for you. And then the Luke 15, 20, he's not just waiting, he sees you and he runs to you, throws his arms around you, kisses you, and celebrates you. And then he says, I'm going to give you the ability today again by the Spirit to know how wide and long and high and deep is this love for you, to know this love that surpasses knowledge until you're filled to the measure of all the fullness of me. Welcome. Good morning, son. That'll get you out of bed in the morning. Most of the time. But the last thing, I promise, the last thing, is that then these last verses that you'll read, taste and see that the Lord is good. Mm. Or he says, listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. And he uses these food metaphors. Remember Jesus, all you are hungry, all you who are thirsty. And then it hit me one day. Do you realize that you and I, all of us, we were nourished through the umbilical cord of our moms for nine months. It was very efficient. It got the job done. We grew and we were born. If food were only about nourishment, God would have had the umbilical cord cut at the placenta and retract. And every time we got hungry or thirsty, we'd just come over to a food source and plug it in. It worked for mom. Worked with mom. If food were only about nourishment, we would have a retractable umbilical cord. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but isn't it awesome that God cut it at our navel and gave us taste buds? and the ability to smell, and then gave us variations on food and drink beyond our comprehension. And we look forward to eating and drinking 
And we have those moments when you're, you're just so satisfied. You're like, ah. Oh. And Jesus says, God says, listen, listen to me. Come be loved by me and your soul will be satisfied as in the richest of food. You're not just supposed to understand his love by reading about it or studying it. Wimberg used to say, sometimes Christians are so crazy. It's like Christians come into a restaurant and they do and parse the menu and all the ingredients and never bother to eat. Sometimes we go into church and we parse the book and we parse the menu, but we don't eat. His love and His presence was about eating. And we're supposed to experience His love in such a way that we go, ooh, la la! When do we do it again? Well, about four hours from now. <laughs> a couple hours from now. His intention was that our experience of His love would be so profound, so tasty, that we would be satisfied as they were the richest of foods. So that you would sing for joy, he says, and be glad all your days. And I'm telling you guys, when you're experiencing his love like that, you can't keep quiet because you want to invite people into that. Amen. How many of you have experienced a phenomenal meal and you were so quick to talk about it? Invite them to that restaurant, that book, that movie, that church, that whatever. NCS retreats because you experienced something good. May God rescue and restore your walks with Him in such a way that you learn how to come and be loved every day. And some days are manna days, some days are quail days. I know it's not always as though it's Thanksgiving, but you get what I'm saying. It tastes good to be loved in any way, in any measure. And you want others to taste it too. And may God help us to learn to experience Him that way because that'll change us and transform us and it'll change the world. Amen. Amen.